Hi, and welcome to another segment on how to live your best life with me, Dr. Paul Machino. Hopefully you're enjoying these monthly live events that I'm doing, and um, I'm just uh, waiting for people to come online as they do. I'll mention them. Um, but tonight, what I and what my aim is, is um, to address your stress, really. That's what I really want to do. Perhaps you're maybe uh, just making sure my mic is working, everyone's working. Ali, hello. Hi, Ali. So glad you joined us. That's great. Um, and I was just mentioning, tonight I want to address your stress. So tonight I want to go over um, things that are causing you stress. Uh, perhaps you're having... Um, uh, an issue or stress around some type of relationship, like maybe with your a spouse or, or an ex-spouse. Hey, Joanne. Um, maybe you're having a, a strife around or stress around a relationship around your, maybe a sibling, a brother, a sister, somebody, or an in-law, maybe a parent, uh, maybe a co-worker, maybe a boss. You're having stress around that. Um, maybe you're, I don't know if you are, but maybe you, are you harboring resentment? Hey, Marianne, hello, welcome. Um, and Or maybe you're walking eggshells around somebody. Maybe the stress uh, is causing you some type of um, health issue. Maybe it's making you sick in some way. Hey, Cyrilla. Um, maybe it's um, uh, causing you to have headaches or back aches or neck aches or digestive issues. Or uh, maybe it's uh, causing um, high blood pressure or other conditions that are that are stress related. Some people emotionally eat as a result of their stress. Maybe perhaps you're gaining weight as a result or perhaps you're uh, feeling financial stress as a result. Um, and so I want to teach you something that's gonna really help with all this stuff, all this stress stuff. So really get ready to learn, get ready to take notes because I wanna talk about people and I wanna talk about the problem people in your life. Just why do they do the things they do that irritate you? Why do they behave like that? Whoops. <laughs> well, tonight I want to uh, share with you the truth uh, about them. And maybe you'll find out about yourself too. The truth about human behavior. Um, and this truth may shock you, but it also may set you free. And that's my goal. I want to set you free from your stress. You know, understanding human behavior, is, human behavior has become, or has been, a mystery for centuries. It's only recently that science has actually put together an understanding of the reasons why people behave the way they do. Is that my Auntie Anna? Hello, Auntie Anna. Um, and so I want to share that with you. Um, and tonight I want to explain that to you. Because, believe it or not, understanding human behavior, understanding what, what makes people tick, uh, is actually vital and an impact it makes a big impact on your health um, your longevity and your well-being and so I want to go through that tonight and so uh, we now know from research that psychosocial factors play just as important a role if not more important role than physical ones and how long you live you know research out of Yale University uh, on middle-aged adults shows that they can live an additional four years if they just did all the healthy things that we know how to do, eating right, exercising, these types of things. But what they're finding out now is middle-aged adults can add up to eight years to their life simply by changing their outlook on life. That's huge. That means that you can actually double your life extension just by simply changing your outlook on life, just changing your view of life, overdoing all the physically healthy things. Now, I'm not sharing you this because I want you to stop doing all the healthy things because you know, uh, I'm actually sharing this because I want you to understand the impact that your view or your outlook on life has on your health. In fact, I advise you to do both. Work on your, you know, physical health and work on your personal psychology. So really, if an outlook has that much impact on us, then what is the outlook one should have? What is the best outlook on life that one should have? And research also shows this, science shows this, that the the best outlook one can have on life is the one that savors the inherent goodness in people and in life. This is a fascinating subject. Um, Dr. Richard uh, uh, Davidson, he's a neuroscientist, uh, shows across the board in all his studies, and he's done many studies on six-month-year-olds. Okay, get this. And six-month-year-olds he does these experiments with, and it's shown that they prefer to be and be with people who are inherently good. 
His conclusion is that we are all born with an, innate, with an innate basic goodness. In spite of what the Hollywood movies portray, there's no person born as a demon baby, okay? No one's born a demon baby. And even the most cruel and nasty people in this world were born with an innate basic goodness within them. They have that seed within them. So having this view of life is actually having the view that's true of people. And I want to distinguish this outlook um, from this view of life from having a positive mental attitude. This is not what I'm talking about, just so you know. Being optimistic or having a Pollyanna approach or uh, having a positive mental attitude, okay? In our society, there's a consensus that having a good attitude is, is, is you know, having a positive mental attitude is good and having a negative one is bad. Hello, Anna. Um, and so, um, so glad you joined us. So we have this consensus that, you know, positive mental attitude is good and negative one is bad. But science shows that optimists don't live any longer than pessimists do. So I'm not talking about having a positive mental attitude here. I want to distinguish that from what I'm talking about. Okay? I'm talking about having a, uh, an attitude or an outlook that savors the inherent goodness in people and in life. This requires two things, actually three things, but two primarily. It requires insight and being real with what is. Understanding the truth behind their misbehavior, a person's misbehavior. Um, and so that's what I want to talk. Uh, that's what I want to go through with you tonight. And but when I say these things, people used to say to me, "But wait a second, Paul. How can I have this view of life when I have this problem person in my life? You know, this person is mean or cruel or can be a bully or a tyrant or they can be inconsiderate or not thoughtful or ignorant. How can you say that all these people have a basic goodness in them when I see that they don't? In fact, aren't there?" In, Aren't there just bad people in this world? Um, and this is, the, this is the most difficult thing that people have trouble getting over. Okay? How do you get over that? How do you transform your outlook without compromising yourself or your values? Well, I want to share with you one of the major steps you can take in your life to help change your outlook and resolve the issues and stress around these people in your life. And it, it's distinguished from having a positive mental attitude. It doesn't work. Having a positive mental attitude, I mentioned that before, it just doesn't work. What you need to do is you need to start with the truth. And the truth is, they all born with innate basic goodness. So the question becomes, how do they get from innate basic goodness to this misbehavior? That's the question. But most people don't even ask that question. That's the major question to ask, though. What happens is people just label people as mean, cruel, uh, a narcissist, uh, a bully, a tyrant, or whatever it is, and they just stop there. And they leave them, that's just the way it is. Well, people are much more complex than that. There's more to them than meets the eye. And having that view is more of a superficial understanding of people. Uh, what this requires is going a little deeper. But most people get stuck at that level, just labeling people as, as, as nouns, just some noun, and that's it. So then they come up with this idea that you know what, if they would only change, I'd be okay. If they would only change, I'd feel better. And that's true, really. If they change, you would feel better, <laughs> okay? If they change, you would be okay, right? But really, for these people to change, I mean, what's, what's the probabilities of that happening? Probably slim to none, right? So if you're blaming people for your emotional distress and you'd only be okay if they changed, then you're really locking yourself into a helpless victim pattern. And it's inevitable that you're going to feel frustrated and hurt and angry and irritated and upset. Absolutely. And how is that good for your health? It's not good for your health, right? So we want to get more inquisitive. We want to go deeper. Hey, Anna. Ah, oh, Patricia. Hello. So thank you for joining us. So you want to go deeper. You want to ask yourself again, you know, we know that they were born with innate basic goodness. How did they get from innate basic goodness to this misbehavior? That's the question to ask. And this is where the science comes in. There's only really three possible reasons why they misbehave. Okay? That's it. Only three. And they are because of their personal history, their genetic legacy, or their cultural beliefs. I'll go through each one of those. So as far as personal history is concerned, we know that human beings are all born with um, two basic emotional needs the need for authenticity, authentic expression, and the need for connection or attachment to another human being, to a, 
human being. And uh, this is research done by Dr. Gabor Mate, if you want to read his work. And which one do you think is greater, the need for authenticity or the need for attachment? Okay, the need for attachment. Attachment always trumps authenticity. This means that in somewhere in their past, in their childhood, this is what happened to them. They had a dilemma, a conflict between expressing their authentic needs and their authentic self and the need to keep the connection or attachment to their parent or caregiver or loved one. And they're going to choose attachment. They're going to compromise their authenticity to remain attached to the person, to the parent, let's say. So they compromise themselves. This looks like a whole variety of childhood behaviors. It can look like the little nice girl syndrome or the nice little boy. Hi, Anita. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us. So it could look like the little good girl, the little nice boy who compromises their needs, their authentic needs for the needs of the parent to remain connected to the parent. So they become this nice little boy, nice little girl in order to make sure that the parent's needs are met and therefore they remain attached to the parent. It can also look like the opposite. They could be the problem child where they're causing turmoil in the relationship, uh, it's not relationship, in the di family dynamic. They're causing, their, they're expressing anger in the dynamic or they're uh, being a victim. And this is all also to remain attached or connected to the parent. Um, why? Because negative attention is greater than no attention at all. Usually they're suffering from no attention and they feel that way and they want to exp they're frustrated because of that and they're not being seen for who they are. So, and what happens is if this um, adaptive behavior in childhood becomes habitual, then as they grow up, it becomes solidified into a character trait as an adult. So then they end up being, as a character trait, selfish, a mean, tyrant, whatever it may be, you know, bullies. Um, uh, or it could look like the good girl, the nice boy who compromises their needs for other people. And it looks like that way in adults. So that's the primary reason why people behave that way is because of their personal history. And it came from uh, a, a trauma, uh, emotional trauma when they were children about the dilemma between attachment and authenticity. That's why, you know, to you and me, they're at the adult. This misbehavior is not really an adult misbehavior. It's actually stemming from an adaptive behavior from an early childhood attachment wound. That's really where it comes from. That's why Michael Brown who wrote The President's Process. You want to read him? It's great. He says that uh, they may look like adults on the outside. They're, you know, physically mature, mentally capable, but they're walking around like little wounded children on the inside without them even knowing it. They're just doing that behavior because it's been ingrained in them since childhood. So that's the primary, one of the primary reasons why people misbehave, okay? Looking at that. The second reason is genetic legacy. And that means that certain people are, sometimes they're born with a genetic condition. And because of that, they behave a certain way and they, uh, they're mentally challenged maybe. But these are kind of rare things that happen. Uh, more commonly, when people misbehave, it's due to a, their family history. In other words, they inherited the misbehavior because it was ingrained in their family generation after generation after generation. And the person was born into that family dynamic has now just inherited that behavior without them even knowing why. They, they just think that that is the behavior that we display. This is how we get, this is how our family does it. They get out in the world and they just do that behavior. An example would be if you were born in a family where everyone crossed each other's boundaries, they meddled in each other's affairs, uh, they stomped over one another, then you would think that's the normal way to be. And therefore, when you get in the world and you have relationships and you have these people in your life, that's the way you behave in that relationship. That's your behavior. But really, that uh, behavior, those, those family behaviors, also stem from emotional traumas. Right? Um, an example, if you have a a uh, problem with a person who stomps over other people in order to get ahead in life, you have an issue with that, then uh, the question to ask is, you know, what would make someone, what would cause someone to stomp over other people? And if you look carefully at that, you'd find the answer, and that is fear of survival. Let me give you an analogy, so, or a scenario. Let's say you're in an airplane, and you're traveling along an airplane, and the plane crashes, and let's say it's filling up with water, and there's only one exit. 
would you be kind and courteous to everybody else getting out of the airplane or would you try to kick in your survival instincts would kick in and you try to get out as you try to get out and get out and get because only one little exit you try to stomp over other people to get out more than likely you want to your and your survival me mechanism would kick in you start to do that well that means that if that person is behaving like that and uh, it comes from a family history then in previous generations in that family history then at some point um, the, somebody in that family faced a huge fear of survival. They were afraid of their life. And they used stomping over other people to get ahead in life, to ensure their survival. And that became ingrained in the family dynamic, in the, in the family culture. And that got passed on from one family to the next, etc., generation after generation. And now the person in the present is just doing that behavior without even knowing that that's where it came from. That's just how the family did it. So that's the second reason why people behave the way they do, because they've inherited from their family history, some type, some type of suffering or, hey, Wade, thanks for joining us, some type of suffering, some type of uh, emotional trauma that past generations of their family uh, experienced. They don't realize that they're acting that behavior out in their, in their present life, but really what they're doing is actually carrying the burden of that emotional trauma with them as well. So you can't have a behavior without having... Uh, an emotion driving that behavior. They're just unaware of that emotion, that's all. But they're actually carrying the burden of that emotion or trauma in with, uh, with their behavior. That's the second reason people, hey Leslie, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, that's the second reason, why, second reason why people misbehave. It's because of a, a family history of some type of suffering or hardship or trauma they experienced in past generations and they learn to cope with it using this misbehavior. The third reason is cultural beliefs. Uh, this we're talking about a community of people that believe and, and behave the uh, same way, <clears throat> a similar, they're all behaving the same way. So um, the person was born and raised in that culture, then they're a product of their culture. They behave that way, that's just the norm in that culture. An example would be um, if you were, uh, you know, born into a culture of, uh, and we'll get into this uh, stoicism. But, uh, oh, you know what, even better. Let's say you travel the world and you come across different cultures in the world. You realize that people behave and believe in different cultures differently than you. So you realize that you're probably a product of your culture and they're a product of their culture and they behave in certain ways accordingly. So we, we can also understand that their cultural misbehaviors, let's call them misbehaviors or behaviors, also stem from some type of uh, suffering or hardship that the, those people had to endure in their past as well. You know, when I went to uh, China and Tibet back in 1997, um, they advised us not to show affection in public. It wasn't considered the norm in their culture. You know, not all the Chinese people were like that, but there was an underlying pervasive um, culture of stoicism in that particular uh, Chinese culture. And the question is, how did, they, how did that culture become stoic? I mean, there's other cultures in the world, other countries that are much more emotional, right? They just let it all hang out and they just get all emotional. But they're more conservative and more stoic. So the question is, how do they become stoic? Why would a person become stoic? And the answer is that you become stoic as a way of coping with extreme hardships. And it's, no, it's this case with the Chinese too. If you look back in their history, they were faced with multiple, multiple uh, centuries, 20 centuries or so of extreme hardships, extreme famines, extreme poverty. And they use stoicism as a coping mechanism to get over these hardships. So they don't show their vulnerability, they don't show their weak, they keep up a strong face, and they're stoic. And that became ingrained in their culture from the past generations of hardship. But if you go to China today in those big cities, there's lots of flourishing abundance there. They're doing quite well. And still there's this underlying culture of stoicism. So that's the third reason why people behave the way, because they're actually... Um, they're actually uh, carrying the behavior forward from previous generations, but they don't realize they're also carrying the burden of the previous 
trauma that caused the behavior to begin with as well. They're carrying that on their back with that behavior as well. And really those are the three major things that cause people to behave the way they do. And most people's misbehavior is a result of a combination of all three of these things. You have to look deep into these things. Okay, Paul. So you may say, well, that's great, but how is this going to help me with the problem people in my life? Okay? Remember that they, um, they don't need to change, right? It's your view of them that needs to change. Otherwise, you're stuck in a victim pattern where you're going to become a victim of their misbehavior. Okay? So you need to start with the truth. They weren't born like that. How did they get like that? Well, it's only three possible, possible scenarios, three possible reasons, science shows. Their personal history, their family history, their genetic legacy, or their cultural beliefs. That's it. But each one of those stems from a, emotional trauma or pain or suffering or hardship. The problem becomes our expectations. That's really where it comes down to. We expect people to behave like mature, cognitive adults with us. We expect that. Sure, they look physically capable and mentally aware, but in reality, when they're misbehaving, it's because they have unrecognized un hurts that go back in their past, either personal past, their family's past, or their cultural past. So it doesn't matter what behavior that they display, the question is always, what pain, what fear, what suffering, what hardship would make someone behave that way? That's the question. If you can identify with their fear, their pain, or their suffering, or their hardship in their past, in their personal past, or as a burden that they carry from their family's past, or as a burden that they carry from their cultural past, then it will go a long way to resolving your strife and stress with these people. It will resolve your emotional stress with them. Now, what am I really talking about here? I'm talking about empathy. And recently, I've been posting a lot of stuff on the Facebook page, if you've been there with me, um, on empathy. A lot of information on empathy because, empathy because that's a great place for people to start making changes and resolving their stresses and strife with people that they're having issues with. That's where you want to start. There's more to it than that, but this is a great starting point. And so I want to expand on that a little bit more. So first of all, you do empathy not for them. You're not excusing bad behavior here. You don't become a doormat to bad behavior. That's not, what I, that's not why you do that. You do empathy for you because it will resolve the emotional stresses within you. You'll feel more empathy. You'll feel more, you, it'll start you're getting more non-reactive to them. That's what will happen as you imply this or in, in, do this empathy. Um, and there's really two types of empathy you can have. There's cognitive empathy where uh, you identify with their story and it's a mental understanding. And you kind of go, yeah, I understand why they did what they did. And it usually comes to the conclusion that, well, they did the best they could with what they had. Right? That's some type of empathy, and it's not really transformative, to be honest with you. What I'm talking about is a different type of empathy, the second type, which is called emotional empathy. This is where you identify with the feelings or the emotions of their story. You put yourself in their shoes, and you can identify with the pain, the fear, the suffering, the hardship that they must have gone through, or their family went through, or their culture went through, in order for them to behave the way they behave. And it, it touches the part of yourself, just so you know, that you know, may have suffered in the past for you. I gotta let you know that. It may touch that part of you, and it should, because really, as human beings, we all suffer, as Joseph Campbell says, that's our commonality. As human beings, we all have suffered at some point, in some way, and somehow in our life. And to recognize that within ourselves, recognize that within them, is true emotional empathy. And this is very powerful and transformative for people. If you take the time to do it, it can transform and it can start to unwind the stresses for you around these people. And I, you know, I'm a chiropractor, but I do consults just as this is one component of the consult that I do for people is work on empathy with them and get them to really understand and get them to resolve it with, with themselves. And there's more to it than that, but this is a great starting point. I mean, I just had a client come back from uh, a visit to her native country and she lives here, but her family of origin lives in another country. And uh, before she went on this trip, she uh, went to visit her family of origin, her mother in particular. And before she went on this trip, we did, she, we did a lot of work around her mother because her mother was very critical, uh, very negative towards her. Everything she did was not enough, not good enough. She always criticized, always negative, always criticized, always negative. 
And so we did a lot of work around that, and empathy was a big piece of that puzzle. And uh, she got to a great resolution as far as empathy is concerned. Anyhow, she just got back from this trip, and she shared with me, she goes, you know what? She goes, I was there with my mother, and I could see she was doing all the critical and the negative things and all this kind of stuff, but I could see beyond her behavior. I saw her behavior, but I saw right through her to the inherent goodness that is within her and how it must have been scarred along the way. I could see it was scarred in all different ways for her in order to develop that adaptive behavior of criticalness and negativity. And I saw beyond the adaptive behavior. I was actually seeing through to the truth of her. And I didn't react. It was, it was the weirdest thing. We high-fived each other. It was like, wow, that's so cool. And this made a tremendous impact on her emotional health and her physical health, because she was seeing it as a chiropractor as well. She had a lot of pain and suffering in her neck and shoulders and her back. And it, it, it improved that significantly because she was holding all the stress from that. And it, she allowed herself to heal on a physical level as well. So I invite you to um, try this out for yourself, right? Um, I invite you to, uh, don't just stop at labeling somebody and leave it at that. That's kind of a superficial way to look at people see what's really beyond there, what's really going on inside them. And I gave you the clues to look for is personal, their personal history, their family history, and their cultural history. What really happened in those three areas of their life that caused them to behave like that? And if you look deep enough, you'll find it. And this can lead to shocking and uh, surprising improvements for you. Uh, it, it, it helped me in my life. I developed a process, which I do with people now, that helps people to, to get through things like this. And, and I see tremendous results with my clients. I'm hoping that if you try this, you'll see tremendous, tremendous results for yourself as well. Now, I said a lot. Um, are there any questions that you want to write up on screen? I'm here for you, just in case anything comes up. If not, you can personal message me and uh, on the Facebook uh, group, and I'll do my best to answer you. If you want to contact me, my office number is 905-737-0810. Um, and um, I'm looking for any questions. If I don't have any questions, I'm going to leave it like that. Um, anyhow, oh, guess I just killed... Oh, so Joanne says, I just killed them with kindness and don't let them get to me. Beautiful. That's a strategy. Uh, the thing is that you may be not really truly feeling the kindness. Is that authentic for you? If you're... Some people put up a front, just to, just to warn you, some people put up a front of something in order to get a, a response to other people, but they really don't feel like that on the inside. The, the, with empathy, it's actually congruent. You, you're authentic with who you are. This is truly how you feel. You want to see them for who they are. You don't feel anything other than how you feel. It's not a strategy. It's actually a feeling. It's authenticity. So that's the only thing I would comment about that, Joanne. Any other questions? Yes, no, I'm kind of at, uh, kind at heart. Okay, great. If you really feel like you see beyond them, you see them for their innate basic goodness, it, then if you, she says, no, I'm kind of at heart, then awesome. Then that, if you're, you're congruent with that, I see that. But I also see people doing fronts up with other people just in order to uh, try to get through something. So that's something I caution about. If you're doing that authentically, that's awesome. If you can see that their innate basic good, that's a great outlook to have. Absolutely. Any other questions? Okay, great. As I said, you can personal message me, um, you can get in touch with me, and I'll be sharing more um, on, on my monthly Facebook Live events, so please partake with me. And uh, if not, this is uh, Dr. Paul Machino, me, saying uh, have a great night and live your best life. Over and out. Thank you. Thanks for joining me. Bye now.